Good evening and welcome to Smart Entrepreneurship Decoded on Transcontinental Times. It seems like yesterday, but we are nearly in our 38th episode. And we have met people from the startup ecosystem from every possible direction. One area that I thought we have not done enough justice to is women entrepreneurship. It's also because there are so few of them. I mean, the very few who get celebrated, but there's a whole uh, legion of them behind who struggle to make a name for themselves. Their challenges are different. The world they operate in is almost an unbelievably different world. So I thought, why not call a woman entrepreneur who's experienced entrepreneurship, worked on the skill side, worked in corporate, is professionally qualified, and also happens to be from the city I live in and is right now joining us from this, one of my favorite cities, which is Kolkata. But so while I'm in Jakarta, she's in Kolkata. Both of us happen to be from Bangalore. So without further ado, let's welcome Nisha Dhanuka. Hi, Nisha. How are you? Hey, Nalin. I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good. It's so nice of you to join us. I know a few weeks ago we wanted to have you on the show. And unfortunately, you were ill. So really nice that you can join us now. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you. So tell me something, you know, uh, I know you are, you had an entrepreneurial stint, you had a corporate stint before that, and you are a qualified chartered accountant. What makes entrepreneurship for women so difficult in these times? After all, we are in the 21st century. Okay. So I think uh, even before going into the gender thing, saying for women entrepreneurship, we all know entrepreneurship itself is a very, very lonely and a difficult journey. Uh, when we see successful entrepreneurs, you know, there's so much of history and geography behind it. You know, uh, when they, we see their success, but what goes behind that success is, you know, so much of pain and so much of hard work. You know, so, uh, I've been through this journey from last 10 years. Uh, now, uh, when, we, uh, when we bring women into the scene, you know, uh, and I have interacted with so many women entrepreneurs across the globe, not only from India. And, you know, more or less, we all struggle with the same challenges. Uh, one is that the moment you become a woman entrepreneur or when you run your own business, the challenges are the same. But the expectations from family doesn't come down. You know, you're still expected uh, to be a good mother, to be a good wife, and so on and so forth. And as a woman we also don't want to let our, you know, let ourselves down on those fronts because there's a huge guilt conscious that come in if you're not able to manage the family well. So I think uh, more than the uh, execution, the mindset level, there are a lot of blockages and challenges, you know, that a woman faces. Even today, uh, we talk about 21st century, but if you go and, uh, and I'm not complaining or not saying that, you know, men are not helping, but then the women out there still wants to be that super women. We always call them super women and they want to stay, you know, honest with that tag, which is not required. We are just women. You know, we are not super women. We are not super human beings. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges, you know. Uh, they always have this timing criteria where they want to go back home on time. There are kids who are waiting. So I think all these things, you know, whether it's whether they accept or they don't accept that. But the fact is that, you know, for them, it is their responsibility to do things right. And that's where when you're growing your business, there are a lot of challenges that come. So I really feel that the mindset level, you know, I want to grow is a, just a statement. Really, do you want to grow? Are you ready to go, you know, uh, deal with the, the real mindset change is the biggest challenge I feel. So, you know, you touch an important point. Obviously, you have a social and a family role, which uh, you have to do. It is expected of you whether you like it or not. And uh, often women feel uh, guilty of ignoring one side of it or the other. But even putting that aside, say putting that aside, there is, it is still uh, considered a bit of an uphill for women uh, entrepreneurs because when I speak to them, it does not seem to be an equal playing field because there aren't enough women investors, there aren't enough women mentors, there aren't enough women role models. Uh, so what can be done to, you know, really uh, help people out? Okay. 
So uh, uh, actually, Nalin, you I think you uh, hit the bullseye. First is that uh, we always say uh, there are not enough women investors, and who are there are not easily accessible. So if you go out in the market, there's there's not dearth of women entrepreneurs, but they will always say that the women entrepreneurs are not uh, ready to be funded. When you go and ask any women investor or investors in general, they say that you know, Nisha, you get me then, uh, you know, you get me the uh, these uh, you know businesses, but they're not ready to be funded. Now, uh, I so uh, the first thing is that you have to really look at uh, at it from a different lens. I'm not saying you have to do an impact investment. No, you're not doing any charity when you're investing into business. But then you have to understand that you know they have the thought process is they have never seen that how we. Along with the funding, there's a lot of mentoring that needs to be done. So uh, when I take a deal, they always the first question is that okay, if it's a sole proprietor, uh, if it's a only a single woman, it's a straight away no no. Which I understand, you know, you have to hedge your risk and you can't invest into. If there are two women, the first question comes, you know, uh, what happens, you know? So more than the professional, it's about the family life. They want to know, you know. What is the husband doing? How how many kids he have? If she's not married, what are her plans for the marriage? Come on, you know you can't <laughs> evaluate on these things a business. You look at the business as just as a business. So one is that you know the investors. I don't know. They are they are not so keen. Uh, if I take ten deals or twenty deals, like I have seen that you know the real is unconscious bias, but it's there. You know they are not interested in investing into. Only women funded. Second, uh, women-led ventures. Second is that most of the investors want to invest into businesses which are driven by tech. Now here, the women again, you know, I would say though no, that that's a uh, area where women needs to have that mindset that tech is nothing is not a rocket science. You don't have to make a rocket. You have to get into tech because tech is the way forward. They are scared. They, the moment you want them to involve any tech, they'll say we need huge investment. No, it's not like that. And they're scared. You know, they then they say, okay, let let us grow organically, slowly, which will not happen. You know, how much you will grow organically, slowly? If you really want to have any way, be, be it a small business or big business, challenges are same. So as well as at least think big. So they are they say tech and they are scared of that. You know that again. Creates a big loophole between the, you know, or a big gap between funding and uh, the investors. Yeah, uh, you make yeah. interesting points, you know, because a lot of families, the women runs the home budget, yet there is this bias when it comes to uh, investing with women founders, and uh, right from the thirty, forty years ago, whether it is a legit proper story, or whether it is the latest Nike IPO. Uh, women have succeeded remarkably, remarkably Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So let let's talk about that. So does a you know it's a again a myth or a uh, you know a woman needs to behave extra ruthlessly like a man to succeed. Is that true? You know, I just don't understand. You know, when a guy is ruthless, he's tagged as He's very professional, or he's a very, very business-minded. When a woman is ruthless, she's tagged as ruthless. I do business. I know uh, that you know I have to run. Uh, I have to pay my employees. If I if I am not little, I I don't want to. Uh, it's my business. If I shut down my business, uh, if I'm not able to manage it, you know what's the point of doing it? So we are not ruthless. We are also trying to run the business. You know, keep keep it. Uh, you know po positively uh, moving or cash flow should be managed so when we check out employees it's not because uh, we are ruthless it's because it doesn't make business sense so i think ruthless is not the right word it's just that we are the moment we we act like a business person you know we are tagged as ruthless but when a man does it he is a businessman you know very very what do you, i i forgot the term that they use for guys very very commonly but I, I don't think ruthless is the right word. You know, we are just trying to save our business. Yeah, I agree with you. So, you know, you have been in the, the leadership coaching skills area for a long time. What are the so, some of the skills that, you know, entrepreneurs need in today's world, especially women entrepreneurs? I mean, you, you could tell me generically and uh, for women entrepreneurs as well. Yeah. 
so i think one one very very important skill uh, that I, i i feel is a uh, you know uh, perseverance no business has become successful in over over one year or two years you really need to invest time i don't know where this uh, you know thought process comes at the moment i start a business or a startup within one year two years i'll get funding and i'll then i'll become you know grow big it doesn't happen how many businesses grow like that you have to build a business on a solid business model not by just getting it funded so i think one is that you have to have a perseverance this you know i don't know with these stories and it's not the right thing second i feel uh, especially from women entrepreneurs perspective that you know networking is something that they really need to work on A relationship orientation you only grow when you have the right network and you can't develop a network over just 6 months or 1 year you really need to invest into it it's like we i always say it's like a farming you really need to grow in you know keep Uh, uh, you know doing your work and one day you'll get the results out of it in today's world you, it's only about the connect you know when you when you want to get funded if you know the right people you're going to get funding you know when you want to get connected to global markets if you know the right person you want to get so this the, the thing that you know I'm not good at networking doesn't work the moment you are an entrepreneur you can't say I'm not good at networking you better become good at networking and it is not something again i would say it's not a rocket science you just need to develop how you do develop relationship third is that uh, you know the thing that i i will only make my product or services i will not sell it the very first salesman for and for your business is you if you are not able to sell and before the product or services you sell yourself anybody buying your product or services buy your confidence not your product or uh, uh, you know or services so don't be scared saying that i'm not a sales person i'm a technical person no you can't escape that so i think these three things that you know that ability or thing that to sell perseverance and network you really need to master these three skills so those are obviously right on top of my list as well but one of them that i find uh, as a big gap is uh, financial knowledge Uh, financial acumen the ability to manage cash the ability to make a differentiation between what is a cash flow item what is a pnl item what is a balance sheet item uh, you know we hold india fund fest every year 10 12000 people apply hard and all of them are looking for money none of them have a cfo oh, none of okay. them almost none of them understand the concepts of valuation or the principles of it and i would hazard a good guess 99 percent and above don't know the difference between uh, the three things of cash flow p and l and balance sheet how important is that to you oh absolutely nalin you know in fact i do a lot of uh, you know sessions on this uh, how to manage your cash flow importance of cash flow and the very first question that i ask you know and mostly these sessions are for one business for at least two years to five years and i say so how is your business doing uh, so they will give me the sales number the profit and uh, you know profit and uh, profit number and all those things and then i say how how many do you need funding and everybody invariably you know 99% will raise i need funding so for what you're doing good sales good pro- uh, profit then why do you need money for uh, you know our customer is not paying and this and that we have worked then i said you're not doing good business you know how my, your business would be my, i take as you know the one of the green indicator for doing good business is how much money you have in your a uh, bank balance are you able to manage your operations with the amount of cash you generate i do 100 crore business but if my debtors are not paying what's the point you know yeah. so they have zero they are ready to in fact uh, you know some entrepreneurs i'm like i i'm, I'm i get amazed by their they say we go to any lend to sell the product you know but when we have to go and ask for money we feel shy i feel bad to ask for money you know for two the month three months four months they have their uh, working capital uh, cycle going on i said you know because i don't know th- that's the mindset that if i ask for money they will feel that you know i am a small person or uh, is there a financial problem i said no if sold a product you better go and get your so they don't understand this concept of that you know sales is not everything money coming in your bank account then the entire sales cycle get completed so absolutely no knowledge about uh, you know uh, different between what you say the profit and loss account the cash flow and then the moment they start a business uh, the very concept of that you know cash outflow anything that you invest or you know 
pay. It's a cash outflow. Why do you have to do so much of cash outflow? Why do you need luxury offices? No, even if it's a funded uh, startup. So I think this this understanding of that cash in cash outflow and inflow is so important, and they have no idea. They only talk about the sales and profit, which is equally important. I'm not saying that's not important. You have to definitely need to have that understanding. But the cash flow management is the uh, how how should I say? It's the blood for the business. The moment it's yeah. not there, you will die sooner or later. True. Sure. I'm amazed at how many founders approach me who have more friends on social media than clients, and I ask mm. them, "How come you have more f- social media followers than clients? Especially if you're in the B two C space and all that stuff, right? B two B, I understand, but B two C, so many of them with five thousand, ten thousand followers on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn, yeah. and five clients, ten clients, etc." And uh, so many of them chasing valuation before creating value. You, you make a very interesting points that resonate with me, uh, you know, very closely. Let's shift track a bit because, you know, apart from being a successful woman founder, you've had an exit. Uh, you've closely worked on the financial. You qualified on the financial side. You've closely worked in the leadership skills area. But you've also worked in the investment area. So a okay. lot of founders approach you for investment. Uh, you have been connected in that area, etc. Do women investors look at proposals differently from their male counterparts? Okay, uh, uh, I, I won't say. Uh, see, one thing is definitely there is a little uh, soft corner when it when I take some proposal to saying that these are led by women entrepreneurs. There's definitely, you know, yeah, we want to promote and all, but that that's only the first level. From the second level onwards, no, I would say not worth ruthless, but they are as good as an investors like a man, male investor. Oh, I agree, uh, without a yeah. doubt, without a Absol- doubt. So it's all about so, you know, the, the, yeah. So when when some a founder approaches you and uh, for investment, what do you look for first? What are you looking for to have a conversation further? The very first thing, uh, Nalin, honestly speaking, I said, forget about your business and all, you know, uh, my investors don't in, will not invest in your business. They will invest in you. You know, in two years, you have done something, created something, but that doesn't qualify you to, uh, you know, invest one crore, two crore, five crore in you. They will invest in you. So for me, it's all about uh, how confident is the, uh, is the entrepreneur about her, her business, you know. Uh, you know, what are her goal plans? You know, can she really visualize or you have a vision to take the company to that level? You know, I want growth with her. I know I will grow my company. You know, I have my definite plans around it. Of course, things will change. Things will, uh, we, are, we are in Luka world. But then that, that confidence is something I buy in. You know, then of course, I, go, I get into understanding about the business. The, for me, it's very, very important that the person should know about the finance. You know, do you understand that, you know, what is operating profit? What is net profit? How how do you read your balance sheet? You know, how are you going to give returns to your investors? For me, it's very, very important. So I think the first thing is the confidence. The second is the financial and the, op- and the business knowledge. Well said. I also keep saying that people invest in people, not just the business. At least Absolutely. initially, first, you look at the person. And I try to look at why are you doing this? You could have had a job, you could have been a politician, a preacher, anything in life, a sports person. Why are you doing this? Kya hai? Are you doing this for money, fame, yeah. or you don't want to have a boss? Because those are all the wrong reasons. So <laughs> I try yeah, to look and, at that first. Yeah. And those are generally the reasons. <laughs> That's true. So, you know, the, I'll come to a little bit of a different topic. A lot of entrepreneurs today are getting sucked into the system uh, by the halo effect and the glamour. A lot like in the 70s, 80s, 90s, people used to go to uh, Mumbai to become film actors. Uh, Same way people are coming into the startup world. And like the film business, it is a 90% failure business. 90% fail for some reason or the other. Doesn't make them bad in life. Doesn't mean you don't try. But that is a high failure rate. Now, you also mentioned that some of the skills that entrepreneurs need our networking skills, ability to sell, ability to manage cash, things like that. But many entrepreneurs are actually the ones who had the idea or the one who created the product, but they don't have these skills. But because they had the idea and the product and they hold majority share, they call themselves CEO. 
what is the suggestion for them? Should they step back and be the lead project head, product manager and hold the majority share and make somebody else the CEO with these skills? Or what do they do? Okay. So, uh, see, I am uh, I'm a finance person, okay? And I believe that, you know, ultimately it's how much money I make when I grow my business, okay? Or when I, so it's not about, if I uh, hold a, I'm holding a share in a company which is almost like what, 51%. In another company, I'm holding just 25%. In another company, I'm just holding maybe 20%. Now, irrespective of what level of shareholding I have, how big is my company, how big is my pie matters. So ultimately, this 51% converts into how much of profit in hands, you know, how much money is coming to my bank account is what matters to me. So I always tell entrepreneurs, you know, when you have to let go your share and get somebody who's better than you to grow your business, don't hesitate because that person coming in will grow your business. You know, you would you like to be a hold, holding 80% share with one crore valuation or 50% with 10 crore valuation? You need to decide. So just let go. I think the... Uh, see, uh, uh, if you know that, you know, uh, entrepreneur have two mindsets. One is a king mindset. One is a rich mindset. King mindset will say, no, I, I'm okay. I want to hold my 80%. I'm happy with my one CR. Okay. If you have that mindset, you'll be happy with that. Then don't say about that business is not growing. My valuations are not growing. If you have a rich mindset, they will let go whether the moment they see there's a bigger opportunity. I better take an exit and make money rather than just holding, sitting on it and not growing. What's the point? So uh, it's all about taking an informed call. But when you take an informed call, don't creep about it. As simple as that. So if you're not able to grow, if you're a technical person, please let go. Get a person who can really market and grow your business. Because ultimately, it's all about making money out of the business and selling the product or the services to the right audience. Otherwise, why are you into uh, this entire ecosystem uh, at all? So one, one of the things you mentioned this earlier about the tech leaning of investors. And uh, I want to just probe that a little bit more. Now, in today's world, virtually all businesses use tech to scale in some way or the other. Yet, there seems to be an, have an uh, investors seem to have an aversion to businesses in the food, clothing, shelter kind of area. They seem to have a different class of investors altogether. Okay. And the latest IPOs, etc., even the one I mentioned, Nika, etc., they're not exactly tech, right? Uh, but you can create scale and successful business models with returns for investors without necessarily being leading edge or bleeding edge or whatever you call it. Correct. <laughs> and at the end of the day, for economies like India, where there's such a high consumptive economy at a low per capita level, uh, still food, clothing, shelter has tremendous scope to grow versus uh, uh, just tech. What is your preference? I mean, where is the balance in this? So, uh, Nalin, I, I, I really see this is a very, very personal, uh, uh, you know, uh, opinion from investors about it. See, ultimately, for from investor point of view, investing into startup is just an alternate investment. You know, as I invest into a share market or I invest into debt market, you know, I also invest into startups. Now, uh, what now what happens when they are investing they will see that uh, which are the successful ventures you know which have given a good returns and honestly 60 to 70 percent if you really see are those tech be it, be it the e-commerce or uh, fintech or edtech so they say that you know so they come to the mindset that you know if it's a tech driven the moment i put money there's a scope of the company growing phenomenally you know some 5x 10x if it's an if you really see a, a typical food uh, business or a cloth business you know if how do you scale it up you know if money i get my investors to put in, invest only when money is the uh, you know only the uh, thing that is not letting it grow what do you say you know an obstacle to grow so I don't blame them and they are and ultimately see if I if my investors don't make money next time I go take a deal with them they will also not be happy so it's I'm not dealing with my own money uh, in fact recently you know I, I came across a, a deal where the company is getting into b2c in coffee business you know amazing guy founder is amazing but my investors are saying I mean, how much you will do b2c it's so expensive you know so they're not they're not keen as we said Nike is what nothing but an e-commerce for your this thing he will also become an e-commerce only for coffee uh, brands but 
I, I don't see it's, it's it's something bad or something. You know, for them, it's an investment. If they don't like it, they don't invest. In. And honestly, my pool of investors are all tech driven. You know, for them, uh, tech uh, makes them happy. I I also take those businesses which are tech driven. So you know, just like having an idea doesn't make you an entrepreneur. And there's a lot of focus on the skills that entrepreneurs need, and we have also discussed this so much. Just just because you have money, do you become an investor, or do you need training as well? Oh no! I think that uh, that is the worst thing that a uh, you know a founder can get that to get an investor only for money. You know, when you get an investor, the investor should have complete, uh, even not complete, but a very very deep knowledge about the venture that he's investing into. Because not only money, he gets his network, he gets his experience on table, and then only you grow. So only money, and uh, no, I think that's a very very bad idea to get an investor only for money. Until this, the the founder is so very clear that okay, I just need your money, nothing else. But that hardly happens. They need the person's experience, network, knowledge, and so I I am completely you know no no from my side on that front. Yeah. So chatting with you, I lost track of time. We are nearly at the end, so I'm going to ask you one final question and uh, let you go for the evening. Now you have uh, juggled a professional life, entrepreneurship, uh, many other public assignments along with having a young family so what part do you think you had to compromise oh uh, okay so uh, if you uh, uh, see one thing i have realized nalin that you know uh, the this the very business of making everyone happy is a bad business i have come out of that business uh, you know at some point of time uh, you know family is not happy because i'm not able to give them time sometimes my partners are not happy because i'm not able to give time because i have to give time to my family so i can't make everyone happy at every point of time i decide my own priorities and i don't want to be best at everything i cannot be i cannot be the best mother i cannot be the best uh, director i cannot be the best wife i cannot i want to live an average life and happy with that you know there are certain mantras which i just follow that you know as long as i am happy and i feel that okay what i'm doing is enough i am happy i have gone through this journey of uh, you know through this guilt trip of saying that i am not able to do this that and all but from last 5 6 years you know i've come out of that thing and just want to live in good average life you know average mom average wife average director and i'm good now you have led an extraordinary life you are an inspiration to many fantastically well said you can't make everybody happy if you're making everybody happy then it's not really working out So Nisha thank you very much it has been absolutely delightful to have you on the show and i wish thank you the very you. best uh, you have many many more things to contribute to the ecosystem please continue down your path and i hope our paths cross again thank you very much and wish you a good evening thanks nalin wish you the same and thanks for having me again have a great thank you Bye.